We're gonna talk about anime today. Sorry. So, Neon Genesis Evangelion came to Netflix this week, and a lot of people either haven't seen it in a while or have never seen it due to the fact that it was pretty much impossible to get on DVD after 2008. And while it's exciting, it's also a good time to reflect on the fact that the fan service in Evangelion and in anime in general is kind of horrible. So let's talk about fan service. So fan service is either hinted or explicitly visual media inserted into television and film uh, with basically the intent to please the fans, give them something that they want to service their needs as viewers. Raunchy sex scenes in big Hollywood films is an example of this. Also like referencing stuff that's not in the text is a form of fan service so movies like Shrek and shows like The Simpsons are big on intertextual referencing as a form of fan service. Fan service is basically the creator acknowledging the viewer and saying hey I know exactly what you want so here it is. And that's wherein lies the issue with fan service in anime. <laughs> fan service in anime well, it had one purpose, and that purpose was to get a load of these honkers, these enormous gazongas, these huge knockers, these gigantic bongos. I grew up watching anime, unfortunately, if you can't tell. Exposure to fan service at that age left a bitter taste in my mouth. Uh, I was at the age where I was fan presenting and I was growing into my body and my body was the type of body that was the ridicule of sexism and misogyny and the subject of male desire and my cat is meowing. I love the stories. I love the animation. I love the artistic style of anime. But every time that preview for the next episode would play and Masato's voice would come on on the voiceover and promise more fan service in the next episode, it was just kind of gross. It's not even the nudity or the anatomically incorrect body parts. It was the idea that the female body and the female sexuality was a product to be consumed by the male viewer. It was an offering to these viewers despite how it may alter their perception of this character. It felt like a, a disservice to the writers to create these interesting characters and then just reduce them to being uh, a pair of tits. Uh, Masato Katsuragi in particular was a character that was quite fleshed out. She had a lot of backstory and a lot of development involved in her story arc. She was reduced to being this product for the male gaze. I love Masato. She's probably one of my favorite characters from any anime in general. She's flawed but driven. She's funny at the right times but also serious when she needs to be. She's complex in the way that she has issues and she has her demons and she really works hard to overcome them but also she wants what's best and she is fighting for the greater good. She had a lot of depth and was relatable to a lot of female viewers. Except for that scene in End of Evangelion where she kisses Shinji and then promises to have sex with him if he can save the world. I don't know what that was about. I'm going to jail! Neon Genesis has a lot of glaringly obvious issues. And I still love it. I can look at it and admit that. 
but its biggest crime has honestly got to be its treatment of its female characters. When it's not framing these interesting, complex, well-developed characters as attention-starved, promiscuous sluts, it's basically fetishizing actual children. You know, Ray and Oscar, they are 14. Let's not even go too far into the fact that the three main women in the show are basically just leap pads for Shinji's personal development, which I will say, if there's a narrative that Evangelion gets dead on, it is the the narrative that men who are fucked up by trauma or depression or even questioning their sexual identity tend to use women over and over again in order to find themselves and they project all these issues onto them which further does harm which ultimately leads to them realizing that only they can help themselves and they should have given their female counterparts more credit than what they did. Also the fact that um, Neon Genesis Evangelion literally used this sexualization of the female characters as its biggest marketing device is worrisome. Let me reiterate, I love this show. I think it's fantastic in the way it tells a story, but part of loving something is being able to acknowledge the issues that you wish were corrected. And just before someone comes at me moralizing the fact that the legal age of consent in Japan is 13, don't. The legal age of consent allows for those minors to have sex with each other without legal ramifications, not for a man in his 30s finding a loophole in the legal system so he can have sex with a child. Just don't do that. But I digress. Evangelion is not the only example of fan service. It's literally everywhere in anime, even in shows targeted towards preteens and children. Damn, Anji Woman is pretty hot. Wait, is that bad? Is she human? No, she's a Digimon. She evolved from a cat. Wait, where do we draw the line here? In 2002, the manga Chobits, written by the female collective Clamp, was adapted into an anime. Clamp were previously known for the series Cardcaptor Sakura, which was targeted at preteen females. Chobits is the story of a young male college student finding an abandoned Perscom, uh, short for personal computer, think AI Android built for the purpose of either companionship or to be a maid, uh, like Ex Machina, Detroit Beyond Human, Bicentennial Man. Story goes as it always does. Boy finds bewildered, mysterious, potentially non-human creature um, who's also kind of hot. Boy starts to become enchanted by this potentially non-human creature. And then boy starts to develop feelings for this non-human creature. Um, oh, sorry, wrong footage. So then boy finds out people are having sex with these things, but how? Because they're not designed for sex. They weren't built as sex toys. So how? Oh, oh, okay, I get it. So she has a vagina. It's where her power button is kept. Right, okay. Ain't that the truth? The original manga was written to explore themes of dating and it was marketed for a more mature audience for male readers. The intent was to inspect what dating is like as a young person in an age where technology is becoming more advanced. It also explores the themes of virginity and your first time and also the way 
men view women. One of the designers, Alkawa, said that when she was designing Chi, she was influenced by her emotional discomfort when it came to dating because of the fact that men tend to treat women like objects built to serve them. Clearly the uh, anime departed from that narrative a little bit. The anime frames all the objectification as just naivety and male inexperience and bashful oafishness, acting like men had no control over their response to a woman. So when Haideki wasn't popping a boner over whatever she was wearing at the time, he was infantizing her, speaking down to her in a very patronizing manner. But it was somehow written off as okay because she was an inexperienced computer. Pervert? Hideki is a pervert! Pervert! Hideki is a pervert! Again and again and again and again. Anime pushed fan service to a very specific audience while also alienating another audience entirely. Otakus, weeaboos, misogynists all found a common ground in anime because it gave them the idea that it was okay to objectify women, to leer at them, to treat them as fleshy morsels, to grope and touch them and dehumanize them essentially. And while fan service is for the most part self-referential, it's not self-critical or self-aware enough to deconstruct the harm it does. There's a lot of sacrificing the development and complexity of a female character to uh, just get a load of these big old titties. <laughs> Parody animes existed just like parodies of any genre does and they did exactly what parodying does, mocking all the big tropes of a genre. None did it better in my opinion than the anime series XL Saga. Almost any anime trope under the sun was ridiculed and parodied and satirized in the run of this series. The show was exceptionally annoying but also exceptionally hilarious. The closest western comparison I can think of to compare it to would maybe be the 2012 movie they came together you give me another one and make it a double you look like you've had a bad day yeah <laughs> tell me about it well you came in here looking like crap and you haven't said very much you didn't say that again well you came in here looking like crap and you haven't said very much hey tell me about it well you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Yeah, you say that again. Well, you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Hey, tell me about it. Well, you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Yeah, you say that again. Well, you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Hey, tell me about it. Well, you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Yeah, you say that again. Well, you came in here looking like crap, and you haven't said very much. Hey, tell me about it. Well. He came in here looking like crap. Okay, we get the point. Just in a sense of it wasn't trying to be shy about what it was doing. XL, the main character, was written as an embodiment of basically any main character archetype. She was loud, annoying, oblivious to the world around her. But when in the presence of um, her male crush, she was subservient and obedient. Her protege, Hayat, was the counter version of that. She was the quiet, shy, coy voice of rationale and she died like every episode. All the secondary characters fit uh, an archetype but also the show ridiculed a lot of the more shady aspects of anime so it pointed out that a lot of male characters in anime are pervs. Uh, they treat women like crap. Also that lolicons are literally pedophiles. Did a lot of purposely bad 
plot writing to elude any depth. Critics dragged the show when it came out, pointing out that it had no direction and that it was full of filler material, which is literally every anime I've pretty much seen ever. The constant meta intertextual referencing was a an example of when fan service is used to make a critical analysis of the genre it's a part of, even if the execution of it was loud and immature and jarring at times. Anime is a massively expensive and underfunded industry, and we're in a stage of late capitalism where markets will do whatever they can to draw in as much money as they can to stay afloat. And unfortunately, fan service has fully been utilized to do that. Because, I mean, there's hentai, and you could just go watch that if you want. Or you could watch Wicked City. I mean, it's pretty close. Obviously, there's more out there now marketed for an audience of critical viewers and fan service isn't as rampant as it used to be but it's still pretty bad. I honestly would just love to go back and watch some of my favorite series without the use of women as vessels to push an idea that they are objects for the male gaze. You know? What the fuck? Are you fucking serious? That's all I have to say about that right now. Uh, if you have any additional statements to make or things to say about this topic, please put them in the comments. Give a thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Uh, you can subscribe if you want, but I'm not going to force you. And I'll see you in my next video.